Welcome everybody. Welcome to the Houston Center Arts Festival 2020 and welcome to the post screening conversation panel discussion following Corpus, a home movie for Selena and also a conversation with academics about Selena. Um, and we're so excited to be presenting this program, co-presenting it with the amazing Aurora Picture Show. And we have the incredible artistic director of the Aurora Picture Show, Mary Magnuson here with us to help us introduce this program and to share a little bit about Aurora and also um, Lourdes is uh, Cordelio, the amazing director that we have with us, her work who has actually been shown at Aurora Picture Show. So Mary, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, and welcome everyone um, to this panel discussion. Um, uh, thank you, Houston Cinema Arts uh, Society and the festival. Um, Aurora Picture Show is really happy to be co-presenting um, with you all again this year. Um, so as Jessica said, my name is Mary Magsman. I'm the curator at Aurora Picture Show and Aurora is a nonprofit media arts organization. We're based in Houston. And we present artists made experimental film and video year round. And that includes film and video screenings, performances and installations. And we're really happy to be co-presenting the films by Lourdes Portilla. And I'm really looking forward to this conversation with these amazing women, including uh, film curator and Aurora board member, Margarita de la Vega Hurtado. Houston-based Afro-Latin actor and activist Candace de Meza, and young Mexican-American editor and Houstonian Alyssa Knowles. Aurora had the honor of presenting Lord's recent uh, film, which is so beautiful and poignant. It's an animated film called State of Grace last year as part of the powerful vulnerable screening that I curated. And so it's a great pleasure for us to be co-presenting this program um, with, with her work again and her two films, Corpus, a home movie for Selena and a conversation with academics about Selena. Um, this will be from November 15th to the 21st. And so it's a great opportunity to see these films and we're really happy to be working with the um, Houston Cinema Arts Society again. Um, so thank you, Jessica. Um, and um, I hope this conversation, I know this conversation is gonna be amazing, so. Yeah, thank you, Mary. That was great, and that was an amazing intro. Um, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get this show on the road. Um, so I'm just going to introduce all of our panelists, and then we're gonna start um, getting some questions answered. So we are gonna start with Lourdes, who is our incredible filmmaker um, and has made the films that you know we that you guys just watched that are amazing about Selena. She is a Mexico-born and Chicana identified writer, director, producer of films focused on the search for Latino identity. She has worked in a richly varied range of forms from television documentary to satirical video film collage. Um, so that is Lourdes. And then we also have Margarita de la Vega Duarto, Duarto who is also a board member of the Houston Cinema Arts Society. And she grew up in Colombia and holds a doctorate in American culture focused on film studies from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, where she was an adjunct professor. She is also, has also taught at the University of California in Santa Cruz, Merrill College, and she has programmed, curated, and presented full programs in Latin America, um, Latino cinema, independent American cinema, and documentary cinema as well as has published papers on those subjects, um, plus Colombian cinema, uh, Louis Mal, Louis Brunel, and she was also the executive director of international film seminars, um, organizers of the Flaherty Film Seminar also, organized the Flaherty Film Seminar as well. Um, and then we also have Candice de Meza, who is an Afro-Latinx social practice multidisciplinary performance artist and activist. Her artistry aims to ritualize the public spaces for the reclamation and reparation of, of self through song, dance, theatrical performance, audiovisual installation, diary, memoir, and film and filmed her work um, explores themes related to identity, African spiritual technologies of connection, land and water heavily inspired by the theater of the oppressed. All of her work 
um, intentionally invites those present to invoke, whether physically or sonically, the construction or reconstruction of self-determined, liberated identities. Her speculative fiction playwriting, 30 Ways to Get Free, filmed uh, are filmed microplays that are being produced by the Catastrophic Theater, I believe, right now. Um, and her recursive memoir mythology theatrical performance, Fatherland, uh, was funded by the city of Houston uses fiction as a manifesto to aid in the data gathering on how communities free themselves. All right, so last but certainly not least is Alyssa Knowles, who is a non-linear editor at ABC 13 Houston. She is Mexican-American and grew up in Houston, and I believe she will correct me if I'm wrong, she was born after Selena's tragic murder. She is also a strong, has a strong interest in the intersection of popular and hip hop culture and or youth culture and politics and identity. Her mom is an Astro super fan and Alyssa interned at Telemundo Houston and the Houston Cinema Arts Society and is the editor of our wonderful Houston Cinema Arts Festival 2020 trailer. So we have an incredible illustrious group of ladies, um, cross-generational conversation um, there is so much to talk about. This is like, you know, just such an incredible rich array of people and there's so much to unpack in these films, man, Lourdes, wow. There's a lot going on in these films, which are now 21 years old. Um, yeah, they were made in, yeah, 1999. So, um, I knew, you know, you shared, let's start with you. I mean, you did share a little bit, you know, at the beginning of Corpus, um, kind of what led you to make these films, you know, how you came to know about Selena, think about her, you know, you're pretty transparent, you know, in the film about your thinking there. I, if you could just, you know, elaborate anything further on that and just like 21 years later, um, what are your thoughts now about these films? What are your thoughts now about Selena's legacy, about the conversation? that is, you know, happening, especially in academics. Um, yeah, if you could just jump in there and let's start with that. Well, I think that that's, uh, you know, it was a road that, uh, that led me to all of this was being, coming from Mexico and coming to the United States, which is an entirely different culture and seeing, I started comparing things, you know, as a kid, 13 year old kid, and seeing how we were treating all the big questions that we had as human beings, as immigrants. And uh, that enabled me to really like look very far and deep into what I think made the United States, uh, you know, the American personality, the American attitude towards, you know, each other. And, uh, that I think that experience changed everything for me coming from Mexico because I was coming with a different mentality altogether. And, and this country was so rich in, the, in its contradictions, you know, in its, uh, in its love and its hatreds, all that. So, uh, and later on, you know, I became very, very interested in Latin American cinema and it was very much linked you know, to all Latin Americans and also to the new Latin American cinema movement that was very interested in seeing, you know, our relationship to each other and the way we treated each other. And uh, so that, that was very inspirational for me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that exactly answers your question, you know, but if you have, you know, any other things that you you want to, you know, for me to address, uh, tell me. Yeah, I mean, have you have you watched the films, re you know, more recently? <laughs> sometimes I sometimes I watch them, but very seldom. Actually, yeah. you know, I, I I'd rather see other people's work. Yeah, no, that's natural. That's understandable. I'm just wondering, you know, in retrospect, what your thoughts are about them, you know, 21 years later? I I think, yeah, I look at my trajectory. That's yeah. what I do. That, that's yeah, how, let's talk about know, that. That's how I yeah. think about it. I yeah. think what made me do this? 
Mm -hmm. You know, why was I speaking about things that people really didn't want to talk about? Yeah. You know, why? And I mean, and I've given you the reason, you know, mm -hmm. the, my experience as, as mm -hmm. Mexican, as a Chicana, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, racism, you know, that I experienced very early on. And it was very shocking because when you're born with racism, you that's a given. But mm -hmm. when you come into it, mm -hmm. it's an insult, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, I just feel that in looking back, I'm in a certain way, actually, I congratulate myself, mm. you know, for doing it, for mm -hmm. taking that view, for taking that road. And it was a difficult road to take. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I feel like this is, you know, payoff time, you know, that people really have mm. appreciated everything mm. that I was focusing on then. Mm. And perhaps some people felt that it was probably, they didn't want to deal with that, mm. you know, but the time came that we had to really reckon with it. Mm. So that's an interesting point. So kind of what you're saying is that other folks have caught up and there's perhaps a greater appreciation now for I these films so. than, than yeah. there were 21 years ago. Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there was an appreciation then too, you know? Yeah, I'm Definitely. sure. Yeah. But I think yeah. I'm, I'm happy that, that my children had such a long life. Yes. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they're, and they're thriving. They're doing well. And yeah, and I, I want to jump to Margarita in a second, but I just want to say to your point, what's fascinating to me is like in the um, academics conversation film, how much these conversations, you know, because of the internet, because of Twitter, like are so mainstream now. And I think even, you know, those kind of conversations were more sort of within academia at the time, but now, you know, out of this, in this period of intersexuality, in this period of kind of reckoning and exploring these themes in this very kind of mainstream way. And I wanna to get to some of the younger people on our panel to talk about this too. You know, there's, this is a more familiar kind of conversation. I think it to more people than it would have been, you know, 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the kind of themes that they're talking about, about sexuality, the intersection of sexuality and race. Um, you know, it's just really fascinating how yes. that has really come to the fore. And perhaps that's part of, you know, the secret sauce to how, you know, why your films are appreciated in a new way now. Um, you mm -hmm. were ahead of the game, I think, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and yeah, so, you know, speaking of, uh, you know, showing what is unseen and centering, I want to pivot to our OG on the panel, Margarita, um, who is an incredible, you know, film scholar and, and thinker and writer. And Margarita, can you help us out here and put Lourdes's work in a context, in, in a kind of larger context that she's talking about um, around Latin American film, around, you know, film, Latinx film from the, you know, the Americas, from the US, from Latin America. Um, and, and really put her into a context, and especially around these themes of Urbana and these themes of the intermingling, right? There's some talk in the film about, it's really fascinating. And I also wanna to get to this some of our younger panelists, this idea that Selena looked black, you know? And like this kind of discussion around that. So Margarita, could you just give us some context here? Yes, I, I like to say first that being Latin American myself, as Lourdes is and coming here, it's a completely different sense of race. It's very hard to understand here because in the same family, we have people that are a little darker, a little lighter, you know, one way or another. And probably by looking at me, you don't think so, but I have very close relatives that look a lot darker than I do. And I didn't care. And that was not part of the conversation ever. Mm -hmm. And there was some division of class, but I was lucky enough that my parents did not have a sense of that either. So I grew up being very free with different people. I went to the university in Cartagena first, that is a national university. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, with all kinds of different people. And I never felt, and I arrived in New Orleans right after, around the time of Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And it was awful. Mm. I mean, I've never seen segregation in my life that way that I couldn't get in a bus. You know, I went to take a bus the first day and they didn't let me in and I mm. didn't understand why. Mm. And then the driver 
said, you cannot come up because you are white. Mm. Because it was, but I hadn't even looked at who the people were in the box. It was a box, like mm. in Carena, everybody got into the box and went to the different places, even though right. it was a smaller city. Right. So that's the big difference. Mm -hmm. How we look at color and at race. Mm -hmm. You know, and very much in a family, you can find people of different color. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the previous one is darker than the ugliest one. But you said that's you changing know? now, right? I think you had mentioned that to me in a previous conversation. No, that's, that's since I grew up. There isn't but any it, difference. Oh, it hasn't changed in Colombia? I thought you had mentioned in that. In Catalina, it, it happened. Okay. It has changed the concept of Upper Colombians because there was an ethnographic that you might have heard about, and I don't want to bring him up. It's a, a British guy, and he went and discovered Colombian Afro music, as he called it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that, there had been somebody that wanted the, the Colombians to think about themselves as negritude, which is mm -hmm. a French term mm -hmm. from the sure. Caribbean. Right, so, you know, it hadn't been, but now we're Afro, uh, people have called themselves Afro Colombians, mm -hmm. but it's very, yeah. So, you know, it was what about Lord? Time. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, please that's continue. fine. Yeah. And no, what I, about Lord Lourdes? Can Lourdes. you can you just, you know, uh, as a film scholar and writer, can you just share a little bit about, you know, Lourdes's place? Uh, in oh, Lourdes's the, place yeah. is amazing within Latin America itself. I first I met Lourdes because I went to Cuba to a Latin American film festival. And Lourdes was there. I mean, I had seen her movie, but I had not met her. And it was amazing because in Cuba also, they were trying to change that whole idea of color as a dividing line. Cuba had been very Americanized mm -hmm. in many ways, including right. that one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the Cuban filmmakers were also making films with people of different colors or, you know, in in love affairs, in different things. It didn't have to be, nothing that I could see in American cinema at that time. So from then on, we became friends and she came to Michigan to my classes several times and showed different films and the Selena. And you're a big, classes. and you're a big fan of her work. Yeah. yeah, big fan of her work, right? Work. She's done experimental, a lot of things that people don't, haven't seen. Yeah. And her documentaries about Latin America were also groundbreaking. Right, The right, one right. she did for PBS, for instance. Very yes. different than the majority of them. Yeah, yeah, and explored a lot of these questions around, around identity. Right. Yeah, thank you, Margarita. Um, Candace. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so you know, glad that you were able to join us and be part of this conversation. I'm really curious to know what your thoughts are, having now watched these two, Lourdes' two incredible Selena films. You know, just like, what are your thoughts about the films, about some of the ideas explored and how it may intersect or not with your own identity, um, your own thinking and philosophy? Um, and yeah, and this whole kind of, you know, idea of Afro, you know, Afro-Latin identity, Latinx identity, um, if you could speak a little bit about that and where that falls in your work. Yeah, first, um, Lourdes, it was such an honor to watch both films, especially um, juxtaposition together. It was such a timely conversation and I had to look up what year it came out just to say, I, I can't imagine 21 years ago that these conversations were happening in such a way that we're mirroring the same dialogue today. And just like Jessica said, this is now um, a large dialogue that we're having right now where we're shifting the culture and um, what is Latinidad and whose narratives are we showing? Who gets to cross over, brown or skinned, Afro, descendants of Latinidad and, and Chicanidad and positioning those in greater narrative with the dominant culture and the talk about feminism, the feminist lens versus the, the popular lens of 
the politics of representation for little girls seeing a woman who's brown and voluptuous, who isn't blonde and blue eyed and maybe really thin, who represents them and then analyzing does that move us forward? Are these the representations that we want to have, um, which is something that scholars are having, which is not necessarily the, the conversation that the public is having. So it was, it, was very, um, it was very interesting to consider these ideas then and now and say, how have we progressed and where are we at with this conversation? A lot of places we're still having and asking the same questions the scholars were and what mostly resonated with me, and it was pinpointed a couple of times, is the intersection when you are of a culture, but you're also based in America. And Selena not really being interested in Spanish music and kind of having to find her roots there and in Mexico being viewed as American, but here being viewed as a Mexican icon. And as a first generation daughter of immigrants in America, my work explores sometimes the way that those two things fit together beautifully and how they can also be in, uh, not in conflict, but they can be a complex relationship between identity, are you Mexican, are you American, and how these cultures adapt once they uh, get exposed to another musical form of a different culture and the art and the style of a different culture and how we get this modernized version of a culture um, was great to watch and then think about the conversations about it and think about my own identity as a, an African descendant of IET. So I enjoyed that a lot. Thank you. Um, can, I mean, can I respond to that? Oh yeah, please. Yeah, let's what, get the cross what, what conversation really, going. For me, what was wonderful was a multiplicity of identities that we all embody, all of us, you know? Um, coming from Mexico and coming to the United States and seeing this racism, but at the same time coming from Mexico where in my family I'm, I'm called La Negra, the black one, but not in a derogatory. I mean, there is, there's a way, you know, mi negra querida, mi negra linda, you know, like you're black and I love you. You know, that kind of, um, identity and and then coming here to you're black but I don't want you you know so it's just for us and as the generations change we have to go with that change and figure out how we can love ourselves and each other without really looking at our color so much you know that's not what we should focus on I think you know, there's more, there are the, the human values and the human uh, attitudes of people that we should look at. I, and that's how I feel. You know, it's my personal desire to have that in my life. Because if we look at color, it just, uh, I mean, darker is darker and lighter is lighter. And then they, have, they imply certain things, you know? So that's not what we can look at. I think we should look at culture, you know, and emotional culture and uh, loving culture, that sort of thing. Uh, so in those years when I made Selena, that, that dialogue was happening and it was very much alive. It was big. It wasn't as big as now, of course. You know, I mean, what made it big now is many other things. And also the fact that it has been going on for such a long time. And that there was really, I felt, I felt that there was no love for black people. And that was very sad to me, you know? No, no love for them, why? They're your people too, you know? I mean, like in Britain, coming from Latin America, the way that I felt is like, I was a negra Negrita querida, my little negra, you know, all that stuff. That's who I was. And why can't they be that? You know, why can't we have that attitude towards Black people? And then you look at the history. And historically, Blacks have been, you know, the slaves that, you know, they wanted them uh, to be, you know? 
And I think that rejection has been really like poison. The United States is poisoned with this kind of disdain, you know? And I think that being together right now, it really warms my heart that we're together, you know, that we're talking about this mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, things have developed. And I think this conversation is not gonna end now. That's for sure. Yeah. This conversation is gonna take hundreds of years to resolve, you know, for us to embrace mm -hmm. all of ourselves. Anyway. Um, I, I wanted to jump into that conversation about colorism. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely something that is very prevalent in the yeah. Latino community. Yeah, Lord is. And um, I'm somebody who's more of like a lighter complexion. Yes. And definitely um, growing up, people in my family, they would always be like, oh, I wish I had like your skin color. Like you're so like light and like fair and pretty. And for me, that's always been like super confusing just because most of the people in my family are of darker skin tones um, as well. But also because I didn't really think that way. And um, I guess more like recently it's becoming in conversation so people are talking about colorism more often now and um I even get that recently with um my mom she'll be like oh like I love your skin color like I wish I had your skin tone but I'll correct her and be like no like I really like your skin color like it's you're beautiful like no matter what but um so yeah that's something that's definitely like a big issue with um within the Latino community and um I think that's why so many girls looked up to Selena because she definitely did have those like more indigenous features. Um, so that's something that a lot of people, well, a lot of Chicanas could relate to. Um, and she's always been like a role model to a lot of Chicanas and myself include, um, included, um, just because she's always been so humble and um, she cared so much about um, educating people about uh, the, di the diversity within like uh, Tejano, music like um uh, like the african influences and the indigenous influences so i always thought of her as a role model but um i guess that's something that surprised me too within the conversation that they were having um about her kind of not being such a good role model just because she was more um uh she embraced her sexuality which to me i think that she's like a great model for doing that um because most chicana women don't really do that so that's something that really surprised me in the film so who said that do you remember i, I don't remember it was, it was sandra cicinero so oh, um, sandra was just being scandalous <laughs> i think <laughs> you know as she said like made a that everybody would go what you know <laughs> it was you know what was great about that conversation is that, that they were so relaxed and they just let yeah. everything hang out there were some margaritas though, right? Involved or no? <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. It was never intended to be filmed. They came as scholars mm. to help mm. me, you know, kind of decipher this thing out in the film. And they were all my friends. And then, you know, we decided that we, we were wrapping. It was the end of the shoot. And we said, oh, let's have margaritas. Yes, let's do that. And I thought, okay. So that was filmed in Corpus Christi as well? The... It was uh, filmed in Sandra Cisneros' house in San Antonio. Got it, got it. Yeah, yeah, Alyssa, thank you so much for jumping in there. Did I have that right about your mom being an Astro super fan? Is that a correct? Uh... Oh, no. yeah, she totally okay. is. She takes me <laughs> and, did, and did I have that right that you were born after 95? Not to like out your age, but. Oh yeah, so I'm, I was yeah. born in 97. So two years after Selena was born. So like one of my first introductions of Selena was the Selena film with Jennifer Lopez. And so mm -hmm. for a long time, I actually thought that Jennifer Lopez was oh, wow. Selena. <laughs> so until I came of a certain age was whenever like my mom and my family members had to explain to me that she wasn't Selena and that like what actually happened to Selena. So I had to yeah. go through that and like realize that too. And I was like, what, like she died? Like how tragic, you know, but um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, two and, years after. <laughs> yeah, and I'm I'm fascinated if you could just expand a, a little bit on what you were saying before. I mean, it's so mm -hmm. interesting, your perspective. Just mm -hmm. you know, right, being born two years before the films were made, kind of mm -hmm. how you looked at the conversation and the debate 
um, especially in yeah. academics and um, yeah. And, and also what you, especially what you're talking about in terms of your own journey and your own experience of, of as a role model, the really model music school with all the young girls that were singing with their moms and just want to get your impressions on, on both of those, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so definitely, um, I mean, my earliest memories uh, with Selena's music was like family parties, like always listening to her. So like growing up, I was always just looked up to her. Um, and so whenever I went to college was whenever I really started like feeling like I could relate to her just because she was such a like independent person. And she was, you know, one of the first um, like major the, like uh, women uh, Tejano artists. Um, cause I mean that, that genre was dominated by men for a very long time. And honestly, it still kind of is dominated by men. So, um, she was somebody that I feel like I can, um, relate to a lot just because, I mean, I'm like a first generation college student as well. And she was like the first woman to dominate in Tejano music. So, so yeah, but that was something that did surprise me that they were kind of, considering her not a great role model, just because I've always thought of her as such a great role model. Um, and I don't know if it's just because of like my generation that I was born like after she she died and I didn't really have an introduction of her whenever she was alive. So I always kind of just like looked up to her. And that was another point that they talked about um, in the film about her being kind of like a saint to Chicanos. So I guess I could relate to that. Like I do feel like That's I've funny. always thought of her as like a saint, like she can do nothing wrong. <laughs> But um, there were a lot of good points uh, that were brought up about um, her being like a sexual object. And um, that is something to think about. But personally, I feel like just as a woman, embracing your sexuality is very empowering. Um, so that was just. Yeah. And it, I think the point was also made. I think there was a lot of it was a critical conversation. Mm -hmm. And the point was made that, you know, the value of her claiming her sexuality as a brown woman. And then I think, you know, there was a critical conversation and which speaks to your, you know, journey um, around education, you mm -hmm. know, and around her being pulled out of school, which is, you know, an interesting conversation and point also. But I mean, what I find so interesting is just how the conversation kind of veered into all of these areas. And, and as Cand, you know, as, um, you know, Candace brought up, I mean, this is just, this kind of conversation is happening everywhere now you know, um, in 2020, and especially on the heels of the election, and, you know, especially on the heels of the, you know, results, and kind of all these questions around, like, Latinx identity, and the Latino vote, you know, um, so it's an interesting time to be having this conversation. Candace, I wanted to go back to you, um, and this idea of the construction of self-determined liberated identities, and then what Lourdes was saying about seeing what's unseen. That's honestly a theme that's coming up through the festival, through a lot of the conversations, through a lot of the work that we've been showing that we've been lucky enough to show, which a lot of times is about seeing what's unseen. Do you see that as a kind of piece of, of your work, um, Candace? like this idea of, of you know, revealing and seeing what's unseen? Can you talk a little bit about that in relationship to your own work and that theme? Yeah, I do think um, it's interesting because the conversations we do have around identity now are a lot more nuanced. Um, and to um, Margarita and Lourdes ideas of the stark racism of America, but we do know that in Mexico and in Colombia that the darkest skinned people tend to occupy the bottom rungs, maybe just above the indigenous people of these places, right, who are visibly you know, unmixed and those narratives do not take center stage in our in our collective storytelling about what is Latinidad and is there even a such thing as Latinidad, right? What are these identities and how did they get constructed and do we want to keep them now? And in what capacity and who gets erased, right? And who gets to be included, you know? Um, and how often, and I think, um, my work as, like I say, an African of, of the island of IET, we know that on that island, the, the politics of race are very, very complex between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. And there's so much intermixing between these two peoples historically. And we still see an issue with 
colorism, which is linked to um, anti-Black racism, and and the stories of of Black people who are also immigrant, right, um, from Latin America. And I wanted to kind of highlight that in the conversation about immigration, is that we often forget that yeah. there, there are Black immigrants from these countries. 44% of people in ICE right now are Haitian. And so, and what are the politics of identity for those who are first generation on this end? And let's position that also within a larger conversation that we have about these type of issues and who's part of this. It's more than just the dominant narrative, right? Of which the prior administration seemed to antagonize this idea of, you know, the, the raper um, immigrant, right? And, and drumming up all these fears with this very narrow narrative of what it means to be, uh, to immigrate to America from Latin America and, and what that story is and how nuanced and diverse that story is and what those children, what their stories are being separated from their homeland, the homeland of their parents being in a new land, navigating those both. So um, I think the film did a wonderful job on both ends um, of kind of highlighting some of those unseen aspects of uh, Selena's representation and why it was so impactful and the crossover of that and the lesbianism and how that played into the dominant idea and it within these countries. And I, I endeavor for my work to kind of also bring to the forefront some of these conversations as well. Thank you, Candace. I think, yeah, so I'm gonna go around. This is gonna be a rapid fire um, ending and we're gonna start you know, um, wrapping up, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna just go right to you again, Candace, two questions as we kind of you know, close things out. Um, one, can you please just like share more about your work right now and what you have coming up actually, what you're doing in the world, what you have going on. And I want all you guys to think about that as I get to you and then the second question is Selena's legacy, may she rest in peace in 2020, complicated as it may be. You know, we have the Jennifer Lopez movie from, you know, 97, um, 1997. We have the, um, I found there was a TNT movie uh, from oh, 2018. Yeah, this kind of scandalous <laughs> TNT movie that was on in Latin America about Selena, the fan club head and the journalist that uncovered, I think the lesbianism, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But that's, you know, the family disavows it. And then we have the, uh, you know, sanctioned by Selena's father and her sister Netflix series, Selena, the series that um, begins on, you know, December 4th. And I would add yesterday um, on the streets of New York City where I am, or it wasn't yesterday, I think it was Saturday, I saw a young woman, must have been about 14 years old with a Selena t-shirt on. So her, you know, her, her legacy is alive and well. Um, so yeah, so Candace, what is going, you know, what do you have coming up? What can you share with our audience? And then also just rapid fire, Selena's legacy 2020, talk about it. My project Fatherland, which is uh, essentially an exploration of identity across land, right, across to reaching back to the land of our parents or grandparents and reclaiming identities that have been lost in the transition. That showing, it's a one woman show with a film that accompanies it and there's a live performance with it. And that premieres this December. And so updates, I'm so excited and nervous. Uh, updates will be on my website, candicedemeza.com. And my three of my liberatory microplays will premiere with Catastrophic Filmed um, in the spring. And Selena, I think it's really important for us, although she's become this commodified icon, that we really go back and reconsider her legacy today and revisit who she was then to see what we can take and reform of her now that can aid us moving forward and to really put together an identity that's more than just the t-shirt but like was she a guiding post for us in the way forward that we can continue to use mm, thank you Candace. Good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. yeah, that's okay. go candace <laughs> okay um alyssa brilliant young alyssa who is an incredible editor everybody and so talented and just is going to continue to do so much amazing work in the world and is just such an incredibly smart, lovely young lady. Alyssa, what is going on? What are you up to? What's coming next for you? What are your projects? And yeah, 
Selena's Legacy 2020. Yeah. Talk about it. So I'm still editing, of course. Um, I'm editing for you guys, editing for ABC. My goal is to become a digital producer just so that I can get more into like documentary type storytelling, you know, telling those stories that otherwise people couldn't really get out there. Um, I'm hoping to do that here in, uh, in Houston at ABC 13. Um, so that's my goal. Um, and I think I'll be able to reach that goal. But um, as far as Selena, I think that we should just think about all the things that she really did for the Chicano community, um, just because she wasn't, she was very talented, of course, with her music and um, she was beautiful, but she also really cared to empower like our community and to educate everybody. So just to keep that um, as a memory of her as well, because yeah, she was talented, but she also really cared to um, make our community better. So, yes. Thank you. I like your nails. Oh, thank you. <laughs> they're, really, <laughs> that, they're really cool, the color. Um, okay, Margarita. So I, Margarita, you always know like everything and what's happening and what the haps are, what's, what's exciting in the world, what's going on. Is there anything that, you know, that you are working on or anything that you want us to be aware of that's coming up, anything you want to share, any of your own projects and any parting thoughts um, about well, Selena or Lourdes' films? Well, Lourdes' films I have admired since they began. I mean, that's the truth. And we became good friends because of that. When she came and I was directing Latino Stories in the University of Michigan, everybody was like amazed with her film. Mm -hmm. And it was sensational, the kind of questions that the students asked from her. So there has been that dynamic that we think a lot in the kind of issues that you have been presenting throughout our lives. And I'm trying to do a longer project that I don't know if I will be able to, but I'm trying to do a real history of Colombian cinema that mm. hasn't been made. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, there are several, but happens. they are all from just one point of view. And I, I would like happens. to have a more diverse point of view. Yes. Because I believe you have to present the good, the bad, and the ugly, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. And you don't have to choose because of your personal taste, because that's what film does. It brings people together. You know, you, and in my country, in my area of, of Colombia, which is on the Atlantic coast, there is a mixture of things and people it used to be, I remember going in Philadelphia to see a film about uh, with Gregory Hines and everybody was talking back to the screen. And I felt like I was a child in Colombia talking yeah. in Cartagena and seeing the film because everybody react, interacted with the yeah. film. Yeah, we're missing so that now. Time. Yeah, we're missing mm -hmm. that now. Yeah. yeah, and we see a lot more of that. So I'm looking forward to yeah. that. And I'm yeah. glad we had the conversation. We really covered some very good things. Well, I'm so glad that you were able to be a part of it. I we're so honored that you were. And you were always such an incredible, warm, joyful presence. So it's wonderful to, to bask in that. Um, and Lourdes, who, you know, you are so prolific. You have so many films that you've made. And I'm assuming there are more to come. And Mary had mentioned your most recent film. I don't know if you want to speak a little bit about that or anything that you have, you know, coming up that you want to share, anything that our audience members that really discovered, and I hope there's some of them out there, discovered your work with this program. Um, you know, anything you want to share, any way that they can access your films and any parting thoughts about these two incredible Selena films and about Selena in 2020. Let's see. Well, One. I want to say something about Lourdes, yes. which is that she was part of the LA, LA program in Los Angeles. That was about Los Angeles and Latin America. Not mm. Mexico, but Latin America. Mm. And she did interviews to all the living figures of Latin American cinema. Mm. And that treasure is at the Academy. And, and it's the amazing. Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Science. At the Academy of Arts and Motion Pictures, yes. Excellent. Yeah. And maybe it'll be at the museum now that that's getting up and running. Maybe they'll do something right. with that. Maybe they great. will be able yeah. to bring some of those and because the relationship yeah. is well, there. Well, it's in, it's in good hands with Jacqueline Stewart. She was appointed the curator and she's yeah. incredible. So I think yeah. we're going to be seeing a lot more conversations like this 
happening in the film realm, maybe because of her efforts and others. Um, so Lourdes, yeah, what's, what's coming up? Talk to us. Well, honey, I'm just so happy to be with you and with the girls that are so young and vulnerable and wonderful and smart. I mean, it's yeah, cool. smart cookies, and huh? I, yeah. Yeah. And to be with you, to meet you and to see my friend, Margarita. And uh, I, I, this, this conversation is so profound to, for me. And uh, I want to share some of my work with you. I'll send you links, all of you, so you can see them. And one of them, which is, I think, one of them, a, a very important film that I made in the 90s, which I went, where I went to Haiti and Dominican Republic and dealt with the whole Haitian thing. I don't know, Candace, if you've seen that film. Mm. No, I think you would like it, you know? Yes. And uh, it's a little gift that I'll send you if you send me your emails. Thank you. Okay? All right. Thank good, you. good, good. And in any case, I'm just, uh, I'm doing very little films because I'm older. I have a, you know, a hard time walking and, uh, I can't make the big films that require all the energy and all the spirit, you know, that it took it out of me. <laughs> and you gave I, it to us. And you gave it to us. Took it yeah, out of you. It you it on to us. It's for it's for you. It's for you. And I'm so to me, I am so like it emotional to be together because I think for for black women and, and you know, brown women together, we can get a lot done. We could really get a lot done. And I, it, it warms me and it, it fills me with love for you. And we always have. Thank you. <laughs> and we always will, <laughs> for sure. Yes. Well, I, I am just so pleased to have met you, Lardes, and to you know, come into contact with your work and learn about it. It's just like fascinating and inspiring and incredible. And, and thank you so much for doing this. And Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much, Margarita. Thank you so much, Candace. Thank you so much, Alyssa. This has been such a great, um, rich, you know, tight, but rich conversation. Um, and you guys are all, you gals are all doing such incredible work. And we're just going to keep track of everything that you're doing. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing this. Yes, really thank you it. for doing it. Thank you. Thank you.